And I would like to welcome uh, Lisa Williams. Lisa is going to be talking with us today about the uh, change cycle. And um, Lisa is a coach, a leadership consultant, facilitator, and speaker who helps individuals, teams, and organizations gain alignment and unleash their potential. Lisa is the founder of Lisa Williams Coaching and Consulting and the co-founder of the High Impact Leadership Project. She holds an associate certi certified coach credential through the International Coaching Federation, and she completed her coach training through the College of Executive Coaching. Lisa received her Master of Social Science Administration degree from Case Western Reserve University. In addition to her role as a coach and consultant, Lisa is an associate professor at the University of Kentucky College of Health Sciences and teaches in both the clinical leadership management and human health sciences programs. And she serves as an emotional intelligence advisor in the physician assistant program. She is the former executive director of the University of Kentucky Institute for Workplace Innovation and has served in leadership roles for a variety of other organizations. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Williams today. Thank you, Candace. I always love those bios. I'm like, really what you need to know is, you know, other things that are different than that. But, um, but today I'm talking about change and I'm, it's, it's, this is one of my favorite sessions. And it really became a favorite session March of last year um, because we were you know, just bombarded, inundated with a lot of change that was out of our control. And that's often the change that feels uncomfortable to us, right? Um, is, that, is the change that we cannot control, but we really want to control. And we've been sitting in that space now for almost a year. Um, one other thing about me, so I call myself in this coach space um, because it's not yet a regulated industry. It should be, um, which is why I have, I believe it should be, which is why I have my credential in it. But we can kind of call ourselves whatever kind of coach we want. And I call myself an intuitive leadership coach. And I work with individuals who are in leadership roles and individuals who are not. But I carry that term intuitive leadership coach because I believe that whenever we quiet the noise around us, that we hold all the answers within and that our intuition guides us when we listen to it. And so we can quiet that space and, and really tune in. And that's what I help people do. I help them find, and you'll hear me talk about the three S's. I help them find space, structure, and support. Those three S's I found are really important for anyone who is wanting to move from where they are to somewhere else. Um, and that may be a small movement, like establishing a new habit. Um, and it may be a really big movement, like switching a career or making a, you know, another significant decision. Um, and always in it all is emotional intelligence. And when we talk about being able to navigate change and understand change and help others navigate and process change, it really falls under that umbrella of emotional intelligence. And I don't think we realize how, um, how much change is happening in our lives on a daily basis and also how cyclical that change is. And that's what we're looking at today with the change cycle. So I am gonna share a couple of slides and let me hope I got it, I have it pulled up right. One second, I had it ready to go and of course, it's the wrong one. Okay. So first, let's just talk about the dynamics of change. So we, as we know, we've always been, but March of last year definitely invited us into a better understanding about living in what we call this VUCA world, this environment that is volatile, it is uncertain, complex, um, ambiguous, it is always changing, and we are constantly adapting to it. Um, in another presentation, and maybe I'll see if I can get this link out to you all later, but in another presentation, I talk about living above the line or below the line. And Candace, I know you know this 
um, video well, but when we are in this VUCA world, we are accustomed to living below the line, meaning that we are sitting in scarcity, fear. Um, we're looking at the complexities of challenges instead of the complexities of opportunities. And when we exist longer and longer in a VUCA world without the emotional intelligence to adapt to go above the line, we start to go further and further below the line. So that's just something important to remember. And when we are below the line, it is harder for us to adapt to new change that comes on. We may be feeling that right now if you have been, um, you know, just with the different complexities that have happened since March with the pandemic, you may be at a point where you say, one more, I cannot handle one more change, right? I, I just needed to kind of get back into a flow. And that's because sitting in this state of a VUCA world, we are just continually cycling in that below the line scarcity, fear-based mentality. And we're going to see how that shows up in change cycle. Um, other change dynamics is we're going to look at this change cycle to help you understand how you navigate change, but also help you understand how to help others navigate change. And an important thing when we are looking at helping others navigate change is that we want to influence change, not demand it. So the difference, and I'm sure none of you say this, but the difference of saying, get over it versus what support do you need? That's the difference of first demanding and influencing. Um, Open system versus closed system. So that's gonna look a little bit like, and we're gonna talk about all of these when we get into change cycle, but that's going to, um, about your perspective in possibility in doing things different in new perspectives as change emerges. So I'm gonna keep using the pandemic, but it's not the only change I'm gonna talk about, but I'm gonna use that because that's a common thing, a common change that we all have. But at the beginning of the pandemic, just think about the way work was working. And then in March and April, we all suddenly had to learn how to work differently. We were working from home, maybe with families also from home. And we could have been in working in places where before, if work from home came up, people would say, oh, no, it can never happen here. We can never work from home here. And then we had to. So that was almost a closed system. It was a demand system. We had to work from home because of the demands of the pandemic, but then we started learning new things. We started becoming open to the possibilities that could come from being able to work from home and from an office and what that ebb and flow could eventually look like. So it's about looking and finding the opportunity is the open system and the closed system is saying, no, it can't work. I'm just going to try to avoid this change as much as I can. Um, Another dynamic that's important with change and helping influence change is to communicate, especially when you're wanting to, to influence others, communicate about change only when you're able to self-regulate. And you're going to see soon that there's going to be a couple of areas, this, um, these different phases of change. And when you're in phase one and two and even three, you likely are not at a space where you get accepted with change enough to be able to communicate about it. Um, and we're going to talk about the hazards that may happen in that. And then the fourth or the final piece, the fifth piece, is to respect the change cycle process. We, we all navigate change in a cyclical way. We don't, we don't recognize that that's what's happening, but it is. Um, but, we, but we also have to understand that our rate of change is going to be different than someone else's rate of change or rate of acceptance. And that takes us back up to two. So when we are expecting people to adapt to change or to accept change at the same rate that we do, which is an easy default, we all, we, we fall into that where we've accepted and we want other people to accept it. Um, when we do that, we are starting then to demand instead of influence. And that, also, that opens up opportunities for hazard, hazard to occur. Um, so that's just a bit about the change dynamics that are at play. Sorry, I've got a little fidgety thing there. So this is the change cycle. And I've credited the change cycle was um, created by two psychologists. Their names are here and you can um, do your own research if you would like on changecycle.com. Um, this helps us understand the process of change. If anyone um, of you on the call are familiar with um, systemic change models, corporation change models, organizational change models, 
you'll know that a lot of those are looking at change kind of from a macro perspective, um, how change is impacting the whole. And change cycle, why I love it, is it looks at change at the micro level. So it looks at change at the individual level. And it's what their research tells us is that there are these six stages of change. And we navigate all six stages, or at least all five, five of the six stages, every time we encounter a change. So whether that is a really small change, it's a minute change, it doesn't make much difference in our lives, um, or it's a grand change, something that's really uncomfortable, something that was unexpected. We're going to go through stage one and likely to stage six, maybe just to stage five. Um, and that process, of course, is going to look different. If it's a small change, it's going to be something that we're really familiar with and it doesn't have much cost. It's, you know, and we, we, we probably won't even realize that we've gone through stage one, two, three, four, five. We're just going to be like, oh, OK. Right. Um, but something more significant, we may stay in stage one and two for quite some time as we learn to navigate the change. So what I would like to do before I go further into this is to see if you can, um, and, and not everybody has to do it if you're not comfortable, but I would like to invite some people, well, I'm getting tongue tied, as many as you as that would like to write into the chat a change that you have been navigating. And it can be as big of a change or small as a change as you would like to share. Yeah, so I'm seeing some positive change coming in, and I'm also seeing some, um, some change that is very grand and sad. All right, change that has... This, I'm looking at Chris's change that has both a pro and a con at the same time. I talk about that for just a second. More time at home, but more time at home. Um, before I go through change, so thank you for those. And if you haven't entered yours in yet and want to, please do. Um, and I may reference um, a couple of these as we move through. One, one thing that I want to mention, and I, I'm just doing this a little bit um, off step, I hope that's okay, Candace, but it's this, it's what I reference as the power of and. Um, and we're going to talk about that a bit whenever we go into acceptance, but um, we can, there's, we, we live in such an either world, either or world, where we have to be sad or happy. We have to um, to Chris's thing, because it's quite neutral, we have to um, want more time at home or less time at home, um, right? And so there's this, this either or that we're always feeling this conflict about. But when we can change the word but or or into an and, we suddenly open up a sphere of abundance. So we can say, uh, Chris, I'm going to keep using yours. Um, I want more time, I'm getting more time at home and I'm getting more time at home. <laughs> um, so there could be this space where I'm happy to have more time at home and sometimes it feels overwhelming to have as much time at home. Um, and so just as we move through this, when we get into, because some of you have, have, um, have mentioned change around losing somebody that you love, around significant loss. And as I talk about change cycle, it's hard sometimes, um, a lot of times, to be able to sit in that space of grief and question acceptance. Um, and so I invite you as we navigate it to, to try to open up and sit in a space where you can um, 
you can carry loss and grief and carry the and carry love and carry acceptance um, at the same time. And, and I, I can talk more one-on-one -on -one with anyone who that resonates with later, but I just wanted to offer that up as I move through change cycle. So we're gonna visit these six changes, um, the six stages, and I'm gonna go into more detail about them. And I would invite you to think about this one change that you mentioned in the chat as we move through all of this. So other change will come to mind, but I'm gonna reference the, the, this every once in a while um, and, and keep the chat going. And so I'd like for you to keep this one thing that you mentioned at the forefront of your mind. Um, I also am very comfortable being interrupted. So if you have um, uh, any questions, put them in the chat or, or I'm okay if you unmute yourself. I don't know if that's okay, Candace, but. Um, so as I'm going through these changes, these stages, I would like for you to think about with this change that you mentioned, where are you right now? And how do you know? So what are the behaviors that you're exhibiting? What are the thoughts that you are having? And what are the emotions that you're feeling? And then we're going to think about what do you need? Again, I'm likely going to talk about those three S's. What space do you need? What structure do you need? And what support do you need? You also may be thinking also about somebody else that you would like to help influence change. So I would like to help influence change with how my, my freshman is um, approaching academics right now, right? I can't demand it, I have to influence. And so I'm thinking too, what are the behaviors, the thoughts and the emotions that I'm seeing from him and what space structure and support does he need from me in order to help influence change? So as we're thinking about this, if you're thinking about somebody else while you're thinking about your change, ask those questions as well. Okay, so stage one, I'm gonna move you all around here for a second. So stage one is, um, is where we start with all change. So remember, it doesn't matter the magnitude of change, we're all going to navigate these six changes. We're just not going to be as aware of them because we're not going to get stuck in change. So stage one is the first stage within the change cycle. And usually when change is approached, um, especially if it's an uninvited, unwelcomed um, change, if it's a grief change, we land in stage one and focus on, um, we're, we're, our mind is going first to survival. So we're thinking about fear. We may be paralyzed about the change. We can't, just, we can't quite comprehend what's happening. You can see here um, to the left, I have behaviors that are socio typically associated with individuals who are in stage one. So that looks like aggression. It could look like withdrawn, right? So it's going to be, um, it's going to be a um, more elevated, response to how people typically deal with stress. So if somebody is a yeller, they're probably gonna get even louder. If somebody withdraws, they're probably gonna withdraw even more. Um, the things that you're going to hear are things like, this can't work, um, it won't work, it can't work, I can't do this, I won't do this. Um, I can't imagine, I can't, right? And so it's all in that space of just feeling really paralyzed, really fearful. Um, the, the, when an individual is in stage one, they may not even be processing what they are afraid of at this point. They may be feeling so numb that they can't even absorb what's happening. So what do they need? Those three S's. So when individuals are in stage one, and I'm, I've got some communication sheets that we're gonna go to so you'll know what to say and not to say, or what you can say when you're in a stage one and what you're really needing. Um, but the space that happens in stage one is, um, and, the, and the support is giving, letting individuals know when they're in stage one, um, and this is what you may be needing if you're in stage one to get out of stage one to move to stage two, is that there is space to be able to process it without feeling smothered, but the support to know when you are ready, there's somebody there to help you. Um, so it may sound like something like, I know that this is a big change for you. Whenever you're ready to talk about it, 
please call me, or I'm going to keep checking in on you every day. And when you're ready to talk about it, I'm here to listen. Right. Um, that is important to give space in stage one because there is a there is slower processing that's happening because of the str the strong amount of fear um, and and paralysis that's happening right now mentally. Um, the big piece here, and you're going to see me repeat it, is you don't have to understand, but you need to care. So I've seen a couple of people in here who have lost a spouse. Um, I, my best friend just lost her husband in November, and I have not lost a, my husband. Has He's dealt with some, some major health issues, but I haven't lost my husband. So I don't know what it's like. I can't say to her, I understand, right? But what I can say is I don't understand and I care a lot, right? Um, and so we don't have to understand. And a lot of times what happens is when we're talking about things as significant as grief, we can get into that space pretty easily of I don't have to understand, um, I need to care, right? But if we're talking about something really tiny, like, I think this is because it's been discussion lately, like my teenager losing his streaks on Snapchat. Like, I don't understand that. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that he's even worried about that. But I can't downplay it. I can't undermine it. And I can't try to get him from stage one to stage six because I'm at stage six about it. I have to let him stay at stage one and process it. So we don't want to downplay. We don't want to be downplayed when we're in that stage. And we don't want others to downplay us. Um, the other thing that we want to avoid is forcing decisions um, and forcing participation. So if you've been in stage one or you've loved somebody or helped somebody in stage one, it may not be the time to try to get them to, you know, get out of the house and go do things. They need to sit in that space. They need the space to process. The thing that they need, the comfort blanket, is some element of control. Um, and that's gonna look a little bit different based on each personality style. Um, let me see how my slides are laid out. We're gonna go back and after I go through all of these um, quickly, we're gonna go back to talk about what to say and not to say. One thing that you're gonna hear me, I've already started doing it, is sometimes I'm talking, um, talking to you like you're the one in stage one, and other times I'm talking to you like you know somebody who's in stage one. And if you're okay with it, I'm just gonna dance between the two because we will be in stage one and we will know someone who's in stage one. If you are leading a team, if you are leading a family, if you're leading friendships, one thing that's really important to remember is that we have to meet people where they're at in change. We can't expect them to come to where we're at. And that goes both ways. So if um, I just gave that kind of neutral example about my son in Snapchat, if he's in stage one and I'm in stage six about it, it is not going to help our relationship or help influence his change if I just expect him to accept it and get over it and come over to stage six and be in full integration about it, right? But likewise, if I am in stage two about something um, and maybe um, somebody else, my husband is in stage four or stage five about something, right? Um, I can't expect him to come to stage two with me because I have doubt. I can't expect him to have doubt too. I have to honor that he's advanced in accepting the change than I am. Is that helpful? Um, if you have any questions about that, please, please message me in the chat. So we'll move to stage two. And this is about discomfort. So when we talk about the pandemic, many of us, when we found out about the pandemic in March, we were first in stage one, but then we, a lot of people got stuck in stage two and stage three. Stage two and stage three is where you will often see people stay the longest. So fear is typically short lived and then they are invited into stage two and they will stay there or move to stage three and stay there. So in stage two, the behaviors that you're looking for are, they are very distracted, um, they're over-processing information. So they are kind of ruminating on the same information over and over again. Um, oh, thank you. Um, 
sorry. So that was, I was like, this sounds kind of weird. So then stage two, it's about doubt. And here they are starting to form assumptions. Okay. So remember in stage one, they were saying like, I can't do this. I won't do this. In stage two, you may hear language like it's not going to work. This can't happen. And there's more projection to other people than just themselves. In stage one, it's very isolating. It's very focused on them. In stage two, the doubt starts to grow to other people involved in the situation. Um, and um, and assumptions start to get made, okay? And this is an important part about the assumptions. And as humans, we are exceptional at making assumptions. So we start to try to figure out the story before we have enough information and we start to make false assumptions. Um, and that makes us feel like we've lost control, but we're making assumptions to try to feel like we have control, right? Um, and there's distress that happens. So the behaviors that we're gonna see are pushing back, um, right? So either resistance saying, I'm just not gonna do it, right? Um, I'm, I'm not gonna wear a mask. I am not going to whatever those things um, may have been. I am, I am not gonna allow my team to work from home. I am not whatever those, and again, I'm using the pandemic examples, may have been. Um, and you'll see that one of the behaviors is begin influencing. So this is where individuals will start to say, because they're making assumptions and they're so doubtful that they're trying to get people to, with, to agree with them. So that helps feel like an element of control. Um, and really at the end of the day, and I, I do a lot of work on with DISC as well with the personality assessment, but at the end of the day, when we look at all these changes, control is always gonna be like, when we peel it back, it's gonna be the thing sitting there in the center. Um, we're all striving for control because that makes us feel safe. Um, what, what individuals who are stuck in stage two need, they need more information. So if you're in stage two right now, an important thing for you to do is try to gather facts, not assumptions, to try to gather facts. And even if that's partial facts right now, um, I was working with an organization and they, the, it was well known that there were gonna be um, individuals that would be downsized. That was, and this happened after the pandemic and that was well known. And so I encouraged the organization to share as much information as they could about the downsizing, even if that was just partial information, even if it was information that just said, I'm sorry, we can't give more information now, but here are the factors that we are looking at. Um, because giving that little bit of information, having the partial information helps decrease assumptions um, and anxiety that's coming along with those. Again, here, you don't have to understand, you just need to care. Um, what they need also is not just the information, but also structure. So when I talk, stage one really needs the space. Stage two really needs structure. In this downsize example, what are the factors that we're looking at? When's a decision going to be made? Um, right, with... Um, Heidi, I'm looking at yours here with more self-care and love. So if you're in stage two around that change, might not be, but just an example, um, is what is the structure that you can give yourself to know that more self-care and love is going to be something that's actualized? Um, what do you avoid doing? This is, you will continue to avoid downplaying and undermining. Um, again, also avoid forcing decisions, discussions, and participation. Um, and there's certain personality styles that are gonna get stuck. So sometimes I weave this in with DISC. There's gonna be certain personality styles that get stuck in different stages. The personality style that tends to get stuck in stage two is the personality style that needs a lot of information to make decisions and needs time to process that information. So forcing somebody will never help um, with, the, with full adaption. Um, and the comfort blanket that's needed is um, structure and information. So moving to stage three, discomfort. Um, so in stage three, this is anxiety is starting to increase and um, uncertainty is feeling really uncomfortable. Um, so you're going to see a lot of unproductive unproductive behavior. So this is going to be the stage where people are like Netflixing and chilling. This is going to be the stage where people's social media scrolling increases dramatically. Um, you're going to see distraction 
and an overprocess of information happening. So for those people that are information seekers, they make decisions by thinking. They're going to be taking in as much information as they can and maybe talking to other people about it. For those people that are typically withdrawn and they're feelers, they're likely going to be numbing themselves in other ways. This is also the stage two where you may see people doing other behaviors like drinking more um, or other things to try to dissociate with the change that they're navigating. Um, what are the things that you're gonna hear? You're gonna hear things like, I don't know the answer, I'm so overwhelmed, I can't focus on this, right? This is, it's too much. Um, so what do they need? Again, just like stage two, information, even if it's partial, um, to be able to contribute ideas. So now is the time in stage three um, where it's a nice time to start asking, what do you think could help make this, um, this change more adaptable? What, what are the things that you need or do you think others who may be in the similar situation could need to help them, um, to help them during this time? Right, so those are things to try to start contributing ideas from them. If in this example, the lay layoff that I was saying, these are the factors that we're looking at. If it was a, um, if it was a kind of more advanced organization and they were really showing it and being transparent, the question they could ask is, what other factors do you think we need to be looking at? Right, so that's a great way to get somebody involved in the change that's happening and help them feel like they're making and an, they're they're contributing to it. Um, what to avoid the same things as we mentioned before, and what is their comfort blanket? Reassurance. So this is the time in stage one and stage two is not the time to tell somebody it's all going to be okay. That is not helpful language. In stage three is when you can start saying, this is going to be okay. It feels really uncomfortable right now. There's a lot of uncertainty and it's going to be okay. And that's when that's when that language will start to be welcomed. In stage one or two, that may sound like dismissive language. You're gonna see here that we've got this great big red danger zone. Remember those assumptions I talked about? So think about if you've been, the, the, what you um, provided me here in your examples of change. If you were in red here in stage two, were you making any assumptions? about how hard it was gonna be, about, um, and, and a kind of more like, more negative assumptions. If you were, what happens when we get to this danger zone? So we've moved through fear, we've moved through resentment, we've got through the unproductive behavior time, and now we're starting to move to discovery. And this is the big threshold that we wanna get over. We wanna to get to discovery. But we get into this danger zone, and if any of those assumptions feel true, we are going to whip back to stage one or stage two. We're gonna get stuck and we're gonna go back. So we want to, um, it's really important and it's, that's where we wanna have, we wanna be talking to somebody and sharing somebody. If we're in stage one, two or three, we want a partner. We want that support, that S support um, to help people um, help us test our assumptions um, because if, if we're creating assumptions and they're feeling true, because that can happen, then we are gonna need support to move out of stage three. And that really is, we don't have the time to get into that today. That's really a whole other piece, but that's just an important, if you see somebody who keeps cycling and they're not getting to a stage of, um, of acceptance around it, it's because that danger zone is keeping them penduling back up to stage one, two, and three. So stage four, when I started leading these discussions at the beginning of the pandemic, I told those that I was working with, stage four is the ultimate place that we wanna get people to get to right now. Stage five and stage six are too progressive for this, this significant amount of change. So stage four, and for those of you who have na are navigating grief, stage four is also a place where um, it would be a healthy space for you to get to and be able to stay there for a while. It's not the expect expectation to move then quickly into five or six. Stage four is a healthy place to be. And stage four is when you say things like, I don't like what's happened and I accept it. So my friend who's lost her husband um, was in one through three probably until 
um, mid-January. And now she can sit in stage four, not always, not every day, but she can get in stage four and she can start to imagine um, what new chapter of her life might look like and be sad and see movement forward at the same time. Um, so behaviors are hopeful. Um, again, that does not mean that you like what's happened, but you're hopeful about moving forward. Um, you can be content being uncomfortable, and that's a big piece. So when we're navigating complex change, it's not about necessarily saying, oh, this is so easy, and that means you accepted it. The acceptance says it's uncomfortable, and I'm comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. So even Candace, I see you nodding because you're the one on camera right now. The change in leadership for office. Right. That's probably a positive. But um, but in, in any of these. So um, I don't want to take the time looking for examples, but. Um, offer pro offering programming virtually instead of in person. Right. So we can be, get into stage four and say, I still don't love it. I mean, I've been teaching online since March. I don't like it. I want to be in the classroom with my students. And I am hopeful that one day I'll be in the classroom and I've learned a lot about being able to flex into teaching online when I need to, right? So that's stage four. Um, what you'll hear is um, more support. So support for, for the own individual, right? Um, and also support for others. Offers to help, especially so, when, when we're in stage one, two, or three, we're often in a very self-centered space. Um, and so we're not thinking as much about helping other people unless being a helper is your like default distress, okay? But a lot of times we're thinking like, how do I navigate this? I, I've just kind of had blinders on in the situation that I'm in. Stage four is when we start to say, okay, I've got a bit, bit of space to see what's happening around me and I can contribute a bit more. Um, and that may be to people who are in stage one, two, or three for a similar change, and that may be for something entirely different. But we're starting to we're starting to be able to um, to open up and have see more around what's happening around us. Um, what it, what individuals need in stage four are as continued information, and so now this is likely more information than what they were getting in stage three, and they need to be engaged. So this is the time where if you know somebody in stage four, or if you are in stage four, this is the time where you may wanna to start to do more things um, and get engaged in new ways. Um, and you wanna focus on results and outcome at stage four. So this is where you can start setting small goals. Um, so my friend who's lost herself, the state, what I see her happening here is she's starting to work out certain times a, um, a week because she knows that that's really good for her mental health right now. And so that's, that's really the only thing that she's focusing on right now. But she needs those small goals as in, for engagement too. Um, so what you want to avoid doing is really heavy focus on deliverables and outcomes, especially if you're leading a team and they're navigating change. You want to avoid these really, because you'll, you'll see like, oh my gosh, this person seeming like they're kind of getting back to themselves. Um, but you want to avoid giving them too much, too much to think about, too many decisions to make. You want to still give a lot of space because that will quickly scare them and whip them back to stages one through three. Um, and what they need in, in this space is um, to feel helped and to, to for people to recognize their progress. Um, and then stage five, and then I think I'm gonna skip, I'll just briefly do stage skip. So stage five is where you see it, an, evolution, an evolution of stage four. So this is where individuals are sitting and saying, I, I made it through that. This is feeling okay. I'm really confident. I'm feeling really good about the change that happened. Um, setting the grief examples aside, this is also in stage five um, and stage six where individuals will say, that was actually a good thing for me. I didn't like the change in the beginning, but this has actually been a good thing. And I think a lot of people will say that um, about the pandemic, not if they've lost someone, but the pandemic in terms of the way work works, right? To say this has kind of been a good thing because it's broken a lot of our assumptions and it's taught us that we can be productive from working from home, that we can flex when we need to, that work can look differently and we can still meet our outcomes. 
Um, so in stage five and six, there is this full level of acceptance. Again, you still don't have to like the change, but there is acceptance and confidence of what has been taught. So five and six is really looking at lessons learned and then moving forward. Um, in stage five, something that's important is stability. So in stage five, and I see companies do this all the time. So if you're leading a team, be careful. Two, it's the compound effect of change. So a team will navigate change and they'll get to five and it's like productivity starting to increase. Everybody seems happy and engaged. Shroom, let's introduce another change. We think we're, they're ready for it. They're not ready for it. They're not ready for it because then they're gonna go back to stage one, two, or three. So stability needs to happen um, with this kind of micro change that's occurred. It needs to stay stable. Um, and remember when I talked on that first slide about this VUCA world, we're talking about one isolated change example here, but there's still a lot of other change that's happening in individuals' lives. Um, you want to avoid going into the negatives of what ifs and kind of thinking about those, getting those assumption things back up. So this is just a time to sit in confidence and to, um, and to, for, to focus on what's working. Um, and then stage six briefly is just, um, this is where individuals, if you're working in a team where they're just going to go and they're really going to be champions to help other people through change. So when we talk about grief, for those of you who grief, somebody who may be a grief counselor might be somebody who has navigated grief, but now they're in stage six. They understand the dynamics of change relative to grief and they are they are then able to help individuals in stages one, two, or three. Um, if you're in an organization or leading a team, you may see individuals who are champions for change because they have navigated the change and they see the, the positivity in change. And then they're starting to help give people space to move through stages one through three so they can start to move to acceptance of change. Um, so a quick pulse here. Um, before I go into the communication piece, because I, I see our time. When you think about the change that um, you mentioned in the chat, what stage are you in right now? Right, I see stage fours and fives coming in. Yeah, Beth, that makes sense. For those of you who are wavering between three and four, um, one thing that I will invite you to do after this call is to take some time down and ask yourself, what is the truth that I need to know? What is the, and answer those three questions. What is the space I need? What is the um, structure I need? And what is the support that I need? Um, and space is going to be anything. So that may be that you need physical space. It may mean that you need emotional space. It may need, mean that you need to declutter your calendar so you're not so overwhelmed with um, how many tasks you're trying to navigate or how many meetings you're having in a day. Um, it can be all of those things. I know whenever I'm sitting in stage one, two, or three, the thing that I need is to cultivate as much space. I need my physical space to be tidy, but I also need my emotional space and my time to be, to be clearer. The structure that you need could be anything from um, you know, having a really like boundary driven schedule, meaning that you're, you're only doing the things that are gonna make you feel productive, feel good, fuel passion for a certain amount of time and stick to those boundaries. Um, and then the support that you're looking for is having accountability partner or having somebody that you can talk to, somebody who can give you 
um, encouragement without pushing you beyond where you are right then. Um, but thinking about what are the truths that you need? What are, um, what are the assumptions that you're making up? And what is the information that you need to verify if that assumption is real or not? Um, and that is, and this is not a plug for me, but that's a really great time to work with a coach too, because they can help break that out for you. Um, so you can have some clarity around where you are. Um, okay, so this is a slide and, and I'll give access to everyone for these PowerPoints too, because I'm gonna go through these quickly. But this slide is saying, if you are leading change, and again, this can be if you are leading an individual, a child, a parent, a spouse, a friend through change, or if you are leading a team through change, the things to be mindful of, so supportive and unsupportive. So remembering that you want to allow every single individual to prog progress through the change cycle at their own pace. You cannot force change. You cannot force acceptance. You have to allow people to move at their own pace and you have to meet them where they are. So if you're a five and you don't understand why they're at one, the job is not to try to get them to be a five or to shame them or ridicule them and saying, I don't even understand why you're still stuck in this stage, right? Not that anybody would say that, but um, I may have said that to my husband a time or two, I don't know, but, um, but is to be able to say, okay, what information do you need right now? What space do you need? What support do you need? What structure do you need? Um, in order to feel safest right now. Um, limit the frequency and amount of change. Recognize fallbacks and know that they're going to happen. So when we are in that danger zone space, we're gonna be cycling back and forth. And what happens, especially if you're navigating a really big change and some small little tiny change comes in, it might feel really big to that person or to you. And so you have to respect that. Um, and our emotions really don't know when we're in anxiety, they don't, they're, they're not placing a value on change. To our emotion in that, especially when we're anxiety, change is change and it's all gonna weigh the same. Um, if you're leading change, you wanna give frequently, um, frequent and timely communication. And so here are some of the things that you want to say. So when we can look at each stage, trying to move this over here, um, these are the considerations, sorry, um, to say for each stage. And I want to first draw attention down because I'm, I'm noticing the time here, but I first want to draw attention down to in any stage, any stage that you're in, are these are kind of go-to questions that you can ask anyone um, or that you can think about for yourself. So for those of you who are, well, we're all navigating change but you can think about these pieces and things that you never wanna say. But let's talk about stage four because most of you had said, um, most of you had said that you're somewhere around stage four. So let's take a look at this one. So asking questions like, what could I do right now that would be most helpful for you? Um, asking about what feels like reasonable outcomes, because remember in stage four, we don't want to push people past where they're comfortable right now, right? This isn't the time to give people a stretch goal necessarily. It's time to make them feel, have what I call, like I'm talking about small wins for long-term impact, right? So we want to give, we want to set people up for success in stage four. Um, Another thing that I wanna draw attention to are the last questions in stage one and stage two. So if you are those on the call who are navigating grief, you've likely heard people say to you recently, let me know what I can do to help. And you've probably thought, I don't even know what I need. I don't know what, that's so overwhelming for me to even think about who's bringing my next meal, right? So something to ask then is this, perhaps I could do this for you. Perhaps I could, um, you know, bring you a meal next Tuesday, right? Um, perhaps I could check in on you tomorrow, especially like, so let's think about if we've got a, a, 
uh, a team member who's navigating some change, right? Instead of saying, what, what do you want me to do? You're offering what it is that you are going to do for them. That is really big for helping influence navigation of change in stages one and two. Um, the language in stage three is about pulling out, um, trying to get a better assessment on what their assumptions are. Do you notice that? So I'd like to hear your thoughts on this change. What feels challenging? Um, and what can make this easier for you? You're starting to learn um, and I have set up meeting thinking that if you're leading a team, you'd want to set up a meeting for this conversation. Um, but, but instead of making assumptions about, um, about how they're feeling in this case, you want to hear it exactly from them about what their assumptions are. Um, and um, Yeah, and you can see what's in stage five and six. This will be if you are, um, if you are especially, well, I think this is a helpful thing for you to print off anywhere, but if you are helping a team navigate change right now, and you probably are helping a team navigate change right now, because we are, you know, here we are on a Tuesday in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I have heard, you know, I teach, um, I've heard students saying they don't know, they can't keep straight which classes are meeting online and which classes are meeting in person, even though they've got it, it's just so much. And then we've got snow days on top of it. And we have some kids who are supposed to be back in Fayette County today, but they couldn't go back and other kids who are not back. And, um, and it, the change is just going to continue to be dynamic. And so even if you're not leading change in your team, you're still leading change in your team because people are showing up every day in this Google world. And so it's important to take, and I know I've gone through these fast, but to go back and look through those slides and start to identify different behaviors. So you can start to make some assumptions based on where people are in the different stages and where you are. And I mentioned earlier, if you're in stage one, two, or three, it is important that you get support to help you navigate those three stages and get to stage four before you are trying to be the front leader or the cheerleader for other change. We don't do that a whole lot in this world. A lot of times we say, well, I've got to look like I'm okay with it. Well, we, we can't fake it all. So it's important to get that help if you are sitting in, in, in a stage one, two, or three around change. Um, and these are, especially if you're, these are, this is really, if you're communicating change in teams, um, the things that you want to be doing. Um, so understanding, first of all, why the change is happening and then knowing how you communicate the change. What is the why? You have to be able to be able, you have to be able to believe it and you've got to be able to eloquently share why the change is occurring to individuals that the change is impacting. And it is, um, it is, has shocked me the number of organizations that forget that starting point. Um, and the why has to be thorough because people are gonna be asking different questions around the why. So do not initiate change within a team until you're ready to give as much information as you can about the why. Um, identify small wins. So whenever we're navigating change, again, whether it's for my son and his grades or whether it is for a huge organizational change, setting up small wins so everybody can have a gauge of how they're processing change and how they can see the impact, the positive impact of change is really, really important. Um, keep momentum going. So offer rewards for new behaviors and consistency. Um, and as much through all of these that you can get is on this number as number three is developing a shared vision and strategy, as much feedback as you can get from the person or people that are navigating change. So I'm assuming you're ahead of them and you're telling them about change. It's so important to get their feedback. Um, I will always say to organizations that hire me to help them navigate change, 
is we want to bring as many different perspectives together as we can before the change is even instituted so we can look for all the pitfalls. That's what I want to do first. I want to look for all the problems. I want to look for all the questions that can happen first because then we can put together a really solid plan that will not facilitate more assumptions. Right? Um, So that is it. I'm going to go back to this first slide or one of these slides with change. What questions do you have for me? I'm always curious if this was helpful. Um, I guess I'll ask you this. I ask my students these three questions at the end of every lecture. What, so what, now what? What did you take away from this? So what means why does that matter? And what are you going to do with the information you learned? And yes, it will be recorded. I think it's recording, yeah. I'm gonna share with you, this is um, my la this slide. If you have any, I talk fast. I covered a lot of information in <laughs> one hour. Um, and so I often stop and have you do some exercises and things like that, that we just weren't able to fit into this. So if you have specific questions about this, here's my contact information and I'd be happy to answer them for you. Lisa, thank you so much. This was- You're welcome. So um, you know, I love, hearing about the change cycle and learning that, you know, it's okay to, to not be okay in the moment of change. Yes. Uh, so thank you so much for all this information. And, and the three S's really stood out to me, space, structure, and support. You know, um, I think I'm gonna take, you know, that with me and really think about others um, and my nieces who are, you know, going through this change um, right now and with school and um, really think about those questions. So thank you so much for your You're time. You're welcome. You know, I real quick about that. I have evolved my entire coaching practice around those three S's because I found, and I started using those three S's because I found that every single coaching client I was working with, whether it was a CEO in an organization, whether it was a mom who had been staying at home, who wanted to transition careers, somebody who just wanted to you know, shift into a different mindset. Those three things, focusing on those three things have been instrumental in helping people move the needle. And I mean, I really do think that, that we can simplify it down to those three questions. What space do we need? What support do we need? And what structure do we need? Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. And um, have a great evening, guys. I know every, uh, some people have a noon um, meeting, so I, you're welcome to and um, Lisa, thank you again. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye, you all. Bye.